Good morning. Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, a little better. One more time. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Kindersley Alliance Church. It's uh, good to be here this morning. Um, my name is Brendan Ness. I'm one of the worship leaders here. And uh, it seems like I haven't been up on stage for a little while. And uh, I kind of missed you guys. Kind of missed singing here. So why don't you stand with me this morning? And uh, we're going to open up and worship God together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you're a good God in all circumstances, and we can, we can pray to you, and we can come to you with requests, and we can come to you with um, prayers of thanksgiving, and um, everything we do, God, we can just bring to you. We thank you for this service, and we thank you for everyone here this morning, um, whether we've been coming here for years or whether this is our first time, God, we just thank you that um, you have a purpose for everyone here, and we just thank you that um, you're faithful and you're a good God. We commit the rest of the service to you. In your name we pray. Amen. And is there, if there are some kids here, you guys can be seated now. I think we're going to call the kids forward to hang out with Mrs. Glass. Any other kids? All right. We're going to pray for you guys, and then you guys are going to go do some fun stuff with Mrs. Glass. So. Let's bow our heads. God, is, God, we thank you for kids, and we thank you for their energy and their enthusiasm, and um, we pray that um, they'll have a fun time learning today, and uh, that they will be excited, and uh, it'll be fun for them. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You guys can follow Mrs. Glass. <clears throat> We're going to call the ushers forward for offering as well. I I guess that was my job too, so, and I will pray for that. God, we thank you that uh, we can continue our worship in the aspect of giving, and um, everything that we have, God, belongs to you, and just as we give back a portion, um, may it be used for um, building your kingdom, not only in this community, in this church, in this town, but um, to every end of the earth. God, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Whoa, there's so many of you. We got, uh, we got some stuff going on elsewhere in our, uh, in our lives, and I get to tell you a little bit about some of that that's happening. Um, and then we're going to enter into a time of prayer. Um, first of all, for those of you joining us from home or from elsewhere later on in the week, we're glad to have you. My name is Peter. I'm the pastor here, and uh, thanks for joining with us. Do me a favor, give us a thumbs up or tell us your name or something. Just let us know that you're here joining with us, uh, just because we want to celebrate that you're here and pray for you. And for everyone here in the building, you are welcome here. This morning, uh, here are some of the things that people in our congregation are doing. Uh, You'll notice that my wife is not here today. She is in Winnipeg, and she is actually on stage preaching as we speak, at a church called The Bridge in Winnipeg, and she has also done a board retreat uh, for their board of elders, which is kind of comical because we are in a series about uh, what is an elder, and she is teaching there what is an elder, and uh, so that's kind of a, a fun thing. That's where she is this morning, and once she is done, she will board an airplane and come on back here, and that's good because I miss her, and uh, they can borrow her, but they cannot have her. Um, so that's where she is. Eric Friesen is leading church at SIR Racetrack in Saskatoon this morning. And I was listening to him uh, this morning. He was talking about how um, he's talking on Isaiah 43. He was also telling stories about how people who were racing yesterday, this is a a drag racing track, racing cars, and uh, there was people in the pits who he was saying, you know, Jesus loves you. And these race car guys were saying, my grandma used to tell me that. It's church. It's straight up is church. And he's leading church there, and he's leading church the same way he always does, which is in a place of submission, in a place of God's called me to do this, and so I'm going to do it. I would prefer to be doing something else, but I'm willing to do this. And so later on today, he'll give me a text that says, I preached. I don't know if it was any good, but I preached. And I'm going to say, yeah, it was plenty good. It was plenty good. You preached, you read the Bible, and you prayed. And he also asked for us to pray for him this morning. And I said, we will absolutely do that. 
And so this is the part of the service where we offer praises and requests to God as we are uh, encouraged and even commanded to do so. And so the first two are Eric at the racetrack and Mandy as she preaches this morning. What else can we pray for? Praise items and prayer requests. Call them out, I'll write them down, and then we'll pray together. Camp school days are going well, and we pray that they continue to go well. Prayer and praise, got it. That's Looseland Bible Camp. What else can we pray for? Oh, I hear you, Robin. We got a bit. We could use a whole lot more. What else? Call them out. Be bold. We're not going to stop doing this, so be bold. Tell us, what can we pray pray to God for? Oh, I heard a voice. Exams. This is high school exams. Yep. High school exams. What else can we pray for? It's funny. When you stand up here, each part of the congregation has a different personality. They're a little quiet over here. You've got to be careful. They get nervous and leave real quick. A little more verbose here. This one's in the middle. How about over here? What's going on? What can we pray for? Healing? Hey, Raise your hand if we are praying for healing, and that means you or someone you love. Mm Mm-hmm. We have healing all over the place here. My hand's up there as well, by the way. What else? That's Darlene Babcock. Um, Is she in the manner, is this a short-term or a long-term thing? Really? Okay, Darlene Babcock. Did everyone hear that? Okay. That is a woman who uh, we have prayed for healing many times, and she has experienced healing, but there is more. And there is, uh, if you know her, you know she is on quite a physical journey. What else can we pray for? God is here. God is in this room. God hears our voice, and he also hears our silence. He has already heard the requests spoken, and he has heard the requests that our hearts have spoken. We're going to pray out loud, and we're going to pray in such a way that it is community. But don't think God missed you. Don't think he didn't hear you. That is not what God does. God hears. The way that uh, we like to do this is, uh, is invitationally, and saying to people, Join with the church as we pray communally for these things. And so I would invite you to stand. And as I pray through these, uh, at the end of each prayer segment, I guess, uh, I'll invite you to say, Lord, hear our prayer. This is something that is just us collectively, our voices coming together, offering up to God. This is our hearts praying to you. Lord God, We first of all praise you uh, that you are here and that you listen and that you have said, I want to hear what matters to you. And all the evidence through scripture where you say, I have heard the cries of my children. And you act. And we thank you and we worship you. So Lord, I want to first lift up what's going on at the racetrack today. And uh, for those who, who can't see, it's just a bunch of people driving cars fast down a track. For those who can see, oh, there's something greater going on. God, I know lots of those guys, lots of those people are not going to come to church because they're afraid they'll burst into flames because they think you're here to judge. Lord, let them hear your love and your invitation. Lord God, Lord, hear our prayer. For Mandy, as she's preaching this morning, we pray the uh, filling of the Holy Spirit. We pray that there are people there who need to hear. Uh, Well, we know that there are. We pray that they have ears to hear and that she has your mouth to speak. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we celebrate what's going on at uh, Loose Lamb Bible Camp with camp days there going well. And there's also uh, a request to you that they continue to go well. Lord, we know that there are kids there who have not heard the truth of who you are.
So Lord, let that truth come very clearly as they do camp and they play games and they eat camp food and they sleep on camp beds and all these sorts of things, God. There's something greater going on. Lord, let us uh, speak well. Uh, Let people hear well. Lord, hear our prayer. For rain, we need it. We need lots. We thank you for that little sprinkle this morning. We needed that. We need much, much more. It is drought. And it is drought right here. Lord God, uh, we ask that you bring the sort of slow, nourishing rain that is helpful. Uh, Lord God, we ask this with all our hearts. Please bring rain. Lord, hear our prayer. For the high school students uh, and the exams upcoming here, just right away quick, some of them have already started. Uh, Lord God, we pray that uh, the work put in is reflected in the marks. Lord, we pray that they are able to uh, go in to do these exams and to leave with confidence that they have done well and will move on to the next part in their life. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, uh, there are many people here who are looking for healing for themselves or for a loved one. Lord God, uh, you are the God that has touched people and they were instantly healed. Or your shadow healed people. We're touching an article of your, your clothing healed people. You are someone who has brought people back from the dead. You are someone who has created health where there was sickness. You created order where there is mayhem. So Lord God, as we each think of the names of the people who we are asking for healing for, Lord, the image of this is that there are broken cells and sick cells inside of them. Remove those cells and replace them with cells that are stamped Holy Spirit. Because you are not sick. You are the great physician. And you can heal. Lord God, we ask for your healing. Lord, hear our prayer. Specifically for Darlene Babcock, who uh, her health journey is long and complicated. And she is a... Uh, well, she's a cherished person here, Lord God. She is young to be in the manor. But she hurts. And Lord, I remember when uh, I asked her what she really wanted more than anything, and she said, I want to ride a motorcycle again. And you gave her that, uh, you answered that prayer, and she rode the motorcycle. And her, <coughs> her complaint was that she didn't get to ride it long enough. They got to their destination too quickly. Lord, let her ride motorcycle again. Let this happen. We pray for healing. Oh, Lord, you understand the complexity of that request. Lord, heal Darlene Babcock. Lord, hear our prayer. For this congregation, for the unspoken requests, we pray that you move in the hearts and minds and bodies of people. Make us bold in our requests as time goes on, Lord. Make us bold. Let us join together in unity and pray together. Lord, hear our prayer. In your name I pray. Amen. Uh, Not last week, but the week before, we started our series on what is an elder. And we were talking about what elders were and the function of an elder... And we got to the place where we said elders, first and foremost, are God worshipers. That's the role. That's the big role. Everything else is secondary to that. Worship God first. And if you don't worship God first, no matter what else you do, you are not an elder. We're having uh, problems here? You want me to just keep going? All right. Pay no attention to the extraordinarily tall man walking around with a remote It's kind of funny, we brought a tech guy in all the way from Rosetown to fix our projector. This is working well. We talked about elders being worshippers and that being their first calling, and it really doesn't matter how good of a farmer they are unless they worship God. It really doesn't matter how good of an accountant they are unless they worship God. It really doesn't matter if they can fly and shoot webs from their whatever. If they don't worship God, they are not elders. This is first and foremost. 
And today we're bringing up the second part of what is an elder. And the reason that we're doing this is because of something that happened at the AGM not not, uh, too long ago, where a question was brought up by the membership saying, who will we consider to be elders going forward? Who will it be? And the answer is, well, we need to talk about it, don't we? And there are some people who are very firm on their answers, and this is specifically having to do with genders. Is it only men, as it traditionally has been in this church, or is it also men and women? And there are some people who, when you hear this, you get really nervous and you might even get angry. And you go, no, it's been this way, this is the right answer, and this is the only right answer. And to that person, I ask you to step back And say, if God has told that to you, do you trust him to tell you again? Do you trust him to tell other people as well? Or is this a conversation that we can't have? And if that is the case, my question to you is, why? And so as the membership got together, we said, we're going to enter into a time of teaching and we're going to work through this teaching and there will be a time where we look around and we ask the people, do we want to have a vote? And we will vote on whether or not we want to have a vote. And depending on that answer, likely at the next AGM or on a a time agreed by on by everyone, we will have another vote. And that is where we are going with this. And so what is an elder? An elder is a person who worships. But there is a next part of being an elder, and it is the part of an elder that is sort of administrative. Now, that just sounds not terribly exciting to me. Administration. Some people really love administration. To me, administration is like the vegetables of the food world. Like you need them, they keep you alive, but that's just not exciting to me. I've never sat down to a plate of turnip and said, oh boy, this is what I'm looking for. I mean, really. Now, some of you, maybe you have, but not me. And that's okay. Some of you will look at administrative things and say, that's a really great thing. I want to do that. And some of you have even made a career out of doing that. And may I say, God has blessed me by giving me you. Because to me, that's not an exciting thing. As a congregation, we can look at eldership and we can look at administrators and we can say, why do we need to have elders anyway? We're good people. We're wise people. We are, we are able to self-govern. If we self-govern, we'll just come up with the answers that we need and away we go and we don't need to worry about all the administration, all of the paperwork. Why do we even have filing cabinets? Why do we have hard drives? Why do we do all this? Why do we need to submit ourselves to an authority? And who is that authority anyway? And there might be a group of people in here or watching from home that say, the only authority that I will ever submit to is the authority of God. And if anyone tells me otherwise, they're just not God. And I'm certainly not going to submit to them. But at the very beginning of Acts, the very beginning of when the church that we would call the New Testament church, what it really means is church that looked in some way or form like this church, when that started, Jesus said, I am going, I am, pardon me, Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you comfortless. Now that sounds strange. What has that got to do with whether or not we should submit to authority? I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to come to you. I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is one of the Godheads, one of the Trinity. We have this idea of God the Father and this idea of Jesus the Son and this idea of the Holy Spirit, all three of them equal, all three of them God, all three of them distinct. The Holy Trinity. And Jesus, who has gone to prepare a place for us, leaves in his absence the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the part of God that does the miraculous, that does the healing, the very thing we were just praying for, that does the revival. 
Holy Spirit is the part that comes and has community with us, that fills us with himself, and in fact leaves us, leaves us with gifts, things that aren't normally parts of who we are, but rather a gift given to us. We didn't used to have it before, and then the Holy Spirit said, here is a gift, now you do have it. And Jesus said, I'm going to leave you with the Holy Spirit, and out of these gifts, there are going to be some people that will rise into leadership. I want the church to be cared for, and there will be those who rise up to do so. And Paul said, Paul said that there were elders, and that we needed to discover who those elders were. In fact, Paul went around and appointed elders at every church that they planted, every single one. That's going to come up later on in the sermon. Do you know that God loves you so much that he left people to care for you? That he left people that actually legitimately care about your growth and development, your Christian development, your Christ-likeness, cared for you so much that they would be in authority over you and would guide you and what they say needs to happen actually needs to happen. God loved you that much. That is the definition of a loving God. He has left you someone to help you and to guide you and to rule. Now that was a word that came up in the last sermon. That's the hard word, isn't it? So long as the elders are there as fuzzy teddy bears, it's good. But what about this rule word? Administration. Elders are there to love you to love about your growth and development until perhaps you grow enough that you care about someone else's growth and development. Interesting interesting intersection there, isn't it? We love the idea of elders are there to basically do our bidding. Elders are there to make sure the grass is cut and the toilet's flush. We don't love the idea so much that elders are there to guide us until we are considered elders. Because something is required of us. What a challenge. In Acts chapter 11, verse 30, how are we doing with the screens? We got it? Oh, good. That's good news. In Acts 11, chapter 30, there's a church... And the church, uh, there's a drought. Um, Now, can you imagine there being drought? Can you imagine there being no rain? I got some farmers laughing, some farmers crying. Stuff doesn't grow. But you know what the amazing thing was? Even though stuff wasn't growing, people were eating every day. And there was less and less food. And there was a church that had plenty and there, well, they didn't actually have plenty. They had some, and there was a church that had none. And so the church went and they put together, sacrificially, they put together some money and some food. And they gave it to the elders of the church, and they sent the elders of the church to the other church, and that those elders gave what they brought to the elders of that church. Why? Because of administration. Because you walk in with plenty and you say, who do I give this to? Who looks like they're in charge here? I have to give it to someone. Who should it be? If I leave it here, it will spoil. It'll get stolen. It'll, it's not going to be useful. But if I give it to the right person, then the right things will happen and people will eat. This they did, entrusting their gifts to Barnabas and Saul, to take to the elders of the church in Jerusalem. There's an administrative role of elders. There's things that they have to do. And they gave it to the elders. Who else would they give it to? Elders have responsibility. And their responsibility was to see to it that it was properly handled. All of the money that comes in through the offering plate or online giving or however it gets here, all of that money goes through the elders. And it is administered properly. 
And it, membership is free to see where this money goes. It is, it is, you're free to see this. But you've entrusted the elders to do this properly. In Acts chapter 6, verse 1 to 7, the church is growing. And here's the next thing that happens. This is one of the things that separates what happened there with what happened here. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history. But as the believers uh, rapidly multiplied, there were rumblings of discontent. The Greek-speaking believers complained that the Hebrew-speaking believers uh, complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against in the daily distribution of food. This is a problem. This is a real problem. This is way bigger than they're playing the wrong style of music. This is something that really matters. So the 12 called a meeting of all the believers. Hey, look, it's the first AGM. They said, we apostles should spend our time teaching the word of God. Elders teach. That's what they do. Not running a food program. And so, brothers, select seven men who are well respected and are full of the Spirit and wisdom, and we will give them this responsibility. Then we apostles can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Okay, so how we have this broken down here is we have elders, and then there's something that in my world we used to call deacons. It's an old word, but it's still around a little bit. And the deacons take care of the practical stuff. The deacons administer the food, they make sure that the the toilets flush. They make sure that all those things happen. And there are some churches that operate with elders and deacons. In this church, what we've done, because of the size of the church, is we've combined those. There's no problem with that. It just means that the role is two parts. There is worship. There is preaching. There is teaching. That is primary. Nothing touches that. Then there's administrative. But if this church grows large enough, we have to separate that. And we have to say, look, we don't have enough time. We're spending our time putting out food. And it's at the expense of preaching and teaching. And the problem is, in town, we have a food bank. The church preaches and teaches. So we want to participate with the food bank. We even want to make sure that people get eat, that people eat if they come through the doors literally by giving them food or giving them a co-op gift card or whatever it is. But this is the work of the elders and the deacons, and we have combined this. So now the apostles are saying, look, we're going to be the elders, and we have appointed these people as deacons. Everyone liked this idea. I, I always think that's funny. Everyone liked this idea. Tell me what idea everybody likes. I haven't seen one yet. Some of you are still stuck on the fact that I don't like turnips. I actually do like turnips, but most, that's just a good one to choose. Everyone liked this idea, and they chose the following. Then there's a list of names of people. And these people were presented to the apostles who prayed for them and laid hands on them because their role is spiritual, even in its administrative nature. So the idea of elder and the idea of deacon coming together, worship and administration, but of those two, worship. Do you get that? It's so important. When we look at who is the elders, it doesn't matter if you are the best accountant. It doesn't matter, matter if you are the best at whatever practical thing, if it is at the expense of worship, because this is the bride of Christ. And Jesus says this is a place of worship. So God's message continued to spread, and the number of believers greatly increased in Jerusalem, and many of the Jewish priests were converted to God is at work here. Something is happening. This would be an exciting thing. This would be something that you would look at and you would say, I want to be part of this. This is something that, that I want. I wish I was in leadership. I wish I was part of the elders board. I wish I was part of the deacons board. I wish I could have my hands on something participating. Doesn't that sound like something you want to be part of as this grows and as people learn and they convert? I've got great news for you. All of that is available to you. 
But you have to participate. You have to participate. I can't do a thing if you won't participate. Same thing available to them is available to us. The deacons took over some of the administration, but the final authority rested with and on the elders. You know it's spiritual to keep the water heater going? We blew a water heater here, oh, it's a year ago now. It's spiritual to keep the water heater going. It's spiritual to keep the floors clean, to keep the microphones on and running. It's spiritual. And there's authority, and there's responsibility. Authority always goes in two directions, always, or it's not authority. The first is you have the capacity to direct the capacity to guide, the capacity to instruct. And the second part is, you have responsibility. And here we enter into the next part. There's a friend of mine who was given the opportunity to become a worship pastor at a church. And this church was sort of figuring, it was a new church, and they were sort of figuring out how to do church. And the way it finally worked out was, his job was to lead the worship team, was he had the responsibility to make sure that the worship team was doing the worship stuff, but he had absolutely no authority in anything. And he was standing there going, my hands are completely tied. I can stand up here and say, come on, come up and play guitar or piano or sing. But I can't go and say, if you're going to do it, first you have to show me evidence of a vibrant Christian life. First you have to tell me who is your Lord and Savior. I'm not allowed to say those things. All I'm allowed to do is invite up, but I'm responsible to make sure that the people up here have a vibrant life. That's crazy. That's like saying you are responsible to grow crops in a field, but you may not have a field or crops or seed. But heaven help you if you don't grow crops. Authority and responsibility, hand in hand. And if you don't have one, you don't have the other. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. Here's here's a part that is a challenge. Here's a part that is culturally not okay. We don't like this. There have been times when we do like this, but not today. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls, and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. Can you imagine if you were a person who did nothing but complain? Did nothing but complain. Everywhere you went, you complained. And when someone was in authority over you, you found a reason to complain about them, be it real, be it something manufactured, be it something that was long ago forgiven, but you can pick that out in our cancel culture. You can pick out the tweet from 10 years ago and say, look, you said this. And the person says, I did say that. I've been forgiven. And you say, yeah, but not by me. And then there's a day that comes that you have need, but everyone in authority over you, when they see you coming, there's a flinch. See, it shouldn't be like that, right? Those in authority should be perfect, and they should never flinch no matter what your behavior is. But the problem with that is, myself included, no one in authority is perfect. And it does affect you. Should it affect you? No, I'm working on it. Pray for me. But it does. If you've done nothing but complain, if you've done nothing but stop things that should be happening, that are good happening, but you're just in a pattern of complaint, it affects you and it affects me. Again, in 1 Timothy 5, chapter 19, do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it is confirmed by two or three witnesses. Why? Because if there isn't two or three people that are all saying, yes, this happened, if it's just one person saying this, then we are counting on that it probably didn't happen. Thus, community. This is one of these challenging things. If there is an accusation, yes, bring it. But an accusation by itself 
is a deeply challenging thing. And Scripture says, do not listen to an accusation against an elder unless it's confirmed by two or three witnesses. Man, we don't like that. We like what I say goes. When I say jump, everyone jump. People in authority or in rule are answerable. They will give an account of the idea, with the idea of a reckoning one day. We will give an account. I will give an account of the gifts given to me by the Holy Spirit and of the gifts given to you by the Holy Spirit. What did you do with these things? Did you do well with them or did you do nothing with them? The one who is responsible and answerable for that which has been given. Not just the elders. Anyone in authority. Anyone with influence. The gifts God has given you, what did you do with them? Did you do something? Did you do nothing? What did you do? It also means that those in authority, when this all ends, the test is harder. Means the test for me is going to be harder. Of the gifts given to me, administration is not one of them. But maybe preaching and teaching? So, did you preach and teach? Did you make that available to anyone who wants to hear in any way that you can? Or did you go, hmm, I'm not going to do that? That's not, that's not my flavor. Once a month, I preach and teach. At Caleb, I have yet to be satisfied with my own preaching and teaching at Caleb. Caleb is the senior's home right behind us here. There. There. Everyone point to where Caleb is. I've got it right. It's right here. Good. For whatever reason, I don't like my flow. For whatever reason, it's awkward. One of the things is people can't hear very well there. So we always start with song. I don't sing. I don't sing well at all. And they say, well, just open the hymnal and we'll sing that. When I grew up, the hymnal was red. This hymnal, someone just printed off, and the songs in it I've never heard of before. So start singing them. So do you know how I do it? I open up to page whatever, and I start to read it at a slightly higher note than I would speak it. Praise God. And then everyone else ca- captures in, and I learn the notes of that song. That's how I have to do it. And I walk out of there going, I don't like what I did. I didn't feel right. I like Sunday better, but I've been called to it. So do I trust God to speak through me, and am I willing to do it? And the answer is yes, I am begrudgingly willing which means I had best get my butt over there and do it, even though I don't like it. It's been a long journey for me. I really don't prefer it. At the manor is another one. You stand up at the front, and most of the people there are not cognitively able to do it, or they can't hear, or they're sick, or something. So how do you get feedback? How do you know the sermon is working? How do you know the Bible study is working? And the answer is, I don't, and I may never, but I'm still called to do it. And I have to trust God. My gifting is what God has given me through the Holy Spirit, the same as what he has gifted you with. It also means, she's not here today, but Carmen is part of God's gift to me. Many of you know Carmen. She works here at the church, and she is my administrative right hand because she does it well, and I don't do it at all. I am. F- this is one of the things. It, it is embarrassing to me. It frustrates me. I wish it were not so. People will often text me, and they will say, hey, We were talking about doing this thing and we wanted you to come and participate, so what do you think? Dot, 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 or should I just text Mandy? And I really want to say, you can text me, I'll do it. The problem is when I go home and I say, hey Mandy, I've planned this, she says, we can't do it on that day. Remember that whole conversation we had yesterday about the thing we're doing on that day? And my answer is firmly, no, I don't remember that. 
I have planned an entire youth group service at our house on my anniversary and didn't know it was happening. I didn't know it was my anniversary till I woke up that morning and my wife reminded me. Administratively challenged. I need a shirt or a hat. One of you should probably do that because if it's left to me, it's not going to happen. So God has gifted Carmen and he gifted me with Carmen. Were it a matter of want, I'd be the best administrator out there. It's just not my gift. It's not my gift. But God has gifted someone else. And throughout my life, God has always gifted someone else who has been able to work beside me. Now, Carmen, she might not be here today because she may have caught on that I was going to say her name. And the last thing in the world that she wants is to be (laughs) with a spotlight on her. Administrative does not trump worship. Sometimes we can get to where if we just had a good administrator, everything would be smooth. No. If we have a good worshiper, then people will be want to become worshipful. And that is the objective. James 3, verses 1 and 2. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church. That's a a weird one to read. Not many of you should become teachers in the church. For we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes. For if we could control our tongues, we, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every way. I promise you this, if I could preach the perfect sermon, one that would capture your attention and would keep your attention through the whole thing, then there would be evidence of life change starting the moment the sermon is over, I guarantee I would do it. I would do it every time. It's what I strive for. I want your life to change. I don't want to leave you where you're at. I want your experience to be like my experience, where I become more Christ-like, I get changed More and more of me is dead. More and more of me is like Christ. That is the journey of sanctification. And I want it for you more than I want anything else. And if I could do it with the words that come out of my mouth, I promise you I would. But I can't. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. And among all the parts of the body, the tongue is a flame of fire. How do you speak? When you speak, is it the words of Christ? When you speak, is it uplifting? When you speak, is it invitational? It is a whole world of wickedness corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. And we can all tell stories of people whose lives came apart because of this little hole right here in the middle of their head. And if only that wasn't there, they would be so much better. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. Ugh. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out of both fresh, sorry, does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. What if your mouth is the clearest evidence of who you are? What if what comes out of your mouth is a window into your soul? 
What comes out of our mouth? Oh man, we are challenged by this right now, aren't we? Who can think of a way as a society that what we have said is not becoming to Christ? Anybody? Any hands up? There's heads nodding all over the place. My goodness. What about me? What about what I say? What about what I say in private? What about what I say when I'm talking only to my steering wheel? What if our mouths are a window into our souls? So what do the elders say? Do we want to be like the elders? Do we want to be guarded in what we say? Do we want to make sure that what we say is becoming of Christ? Or do we reject that and reject the teaching found in Scripture and say, actually, I want to say what I want to say and whoever it hurts, I just got to be me. Have you complained about the elders? What about when the elders said, do something, and you said, I don't want to do it? I don't agree to that. Nobody asked me anyway. This church is a church that in our fairly recent history, there has been uh, some pain, some turmoil. There's been pastor change. There has been stuff. We have a story, don't we? When stuff went down, a lot of things happened that the elders had to respond to, had to respond to. And one thing was for sure, everybody wasn't going to be happy. There wasn't that path. And perhaps there wasn't a path that made you happy. What were the words said about the elders? What was the soul behind that? With authority comes accountability. So the question becomes, how are elders chosen? Two very simple things. First of all, elders are chosen from within. They are members at this church. At this church, with the current bylaws that we have, they are men. That is the question in front of us. They are members. If you are not a member, you are not an elder. You have to be. An el- you have to be a member to be considered an elder for the board of elders. We don't bring in people from far away, and that is because there's an administrative part to what happens. Because there's a practical part to what happens, and because there's a family part to what happens. We want you to be part of this church. The second part of this is, it's by appointment. Now I want you to notice the difference between the word appointment and the word election. We do elect in elders, but if there are no elders willing to be elected, you get appointed. And as a member, this is something you sign on to. That's kind of a challenge, eh? Don't like the ideas of having people come and say, here you go. In the book of Acts, chapter 14, verse 23, Paul and Barnabas also appointed elders in every church. Appointed. They were going places they didn't know the people, and so the question was, who is looked to as a person who worships and a person who is able to deal with the administration? Oh, it's you, you're appointed as an elder. What a challenge. With prayer and fasting, they turned the elders over to the care of the Lord in whom they have put their trust. Now, there's a book of the Bible called Philemon. It's not written by Philemon. It's written to Philemon by a guy named Paul. Paul comes up all over the place in the New Testament. Philemon is never identified as an elder directly. That's not the name given to him. But in effect, it is clear he is an elder. Here's why. 
Philemon 1, verses 4 to 7. This is from Paul. I always thank my God when I pray for you, Philemon, because I keep hearing about your faith in the Lord Jesus, that's one, and your love for all of God's people, that's two. And I am praying that you will be put into action, uh, you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith as you understand and experience all the good things we have for Christ. Your love has given me much joy and comfort, my brother, for your kindness has often refreshed, refreshed the hearts of people. If you continue reading in the book of Philemon, you find out he is a person of great wealth. He's got lots of money. And now, however many years later, we're not talking about his great wealth. We're talking about how he is uplifting to people about how he worships God and everybody comments on that, and then he serves people and everybody comments on that, so much so that that is written into the scriptures. It's an identifier for him. He is an elder. And when you are with him, he is uplifting. One of the questions of who is an elder. When you are with an elder, when you leave that elder, are you experiencing the peace of who Christ is? Not that they have agreed with everything that you said and have done your bidding. That's not how you get peace. But rather, you walk away from them going, I have heard the words of God through the mouth of that elder, and even though I have been told to do things, this person smells like Christ looks like Christ, sounds like Christ. Philemon. Now, here's the next part, and this is the part for you policy people, this is going to be very exciting. In Acts chapter 15, verse 12, there is a problem. And the problem has to do with circumcision. And there's a whole group of people that say, the Old Testament teaches us very clearly about circumcision. And if you want to be part of the church, then you have to be circumcised. And there's this whole other group of people that say, yeah, but then Jesus was born and then he died and was raised again. And he said there's a new way and we're no longer subject to that law. So you don't have to be circumcised. And the first group says, yes, you do. And the second group says, no, you don't, and they're at an impasse. In chapter 16, verse 4, the elders go away to have meetings, to have discussion, to invite someone who is more studied than they are, to ask questions, and at the end of it, to write policy. One of the jobs of the elders is to deal with policy or bylaws, if you prefer. We're in a place where we are looking at our bylaws, and there are different areas in our bylaws where we are having to rewrite some stuff, and this will be stuff that will be brought to you. You'll you'll hear about it once we have something down that that is digestible. But this is why it matters. And once they did this, people rejoiced. They came back and they said, this is what this church does. It's written down. It's in that file cabinet. This is why we need that file cabinet or hard drive. This is why we need the elders. This is why we need the elders to worship and to listen and to deal with administration. Because now as a church, we know what to do. And we are in the same situation now, although the topic is different. You can't just do whatever you want at a church. And I can't do whatever I want at a church. You might think that I can because I wear the microphone most often, but I can't. I work with the elders board. The elders board works with me. The administrative process is there, and we are in submission to the administrative process, and we are in responsibility to the church, and we are in ultimate responsibility to God, and we will be asked by God, what have you done with that which I gave you? It's not a free-for-all. It's not a free-for-all for me or for the elders board or for anyone else in a position of leadership. Lest we think that we have all the answers and can't be challenged and are just smarter than everyone else. That would never happen, would it? Someone who you can't talk to about theological things because you know that it'll be a short conversation of them correcting you and walking away or correcting you and not walking away, which is way worse. 
and there's no conversation available. Oh, man. Oh, man. We should have a series on idolatry. can't just do what you want in the church. The Lord never intended it to be that way, and it was never that way. There are some who won't come unless they get their own way. They're not in community. There's lots of stuff I don't get my own way about. Lots of stuff. I was once taught this saying by a worship pastor who technically I was in charge of. He said, I've had my say, I don't have to have my way. And I thought, nah, I'm glad that rhymed. I'll probably remember that one. If you have to have your way, you're not in community, you're in authority. And you're not in community. This is why we do not have one elder that makes the decisions. You know who the elders board is. Ted, Dwayne, Myself, Myron, Eric, Doug. He, yeah, he's new. Doug. Hey, Doug. I haven't missed anyone else, have I? (laughs) There's not one vote that counts more. And by the way, Doug, who is the board chair, doesn't get a vote ever unless it is to break a tie. There is no one elder that is in authority over the other elders. There is no one decision maker. There is administrator, but not decision maker. And I'm glad for that. I think that's a good thing. I need to keep moving here. There's more notes, but I got to keep going. The other thing is it's not the congregation that said that set the policy. It really isn't. It was the elders. And they came back to the congregation and said, this is the policy on circumcision. Guys, you'll be pretty happy. Our bylaws are very quiet on circumcision. But theirs wasn't. It was something that was decided by the elders after worship and prayer. This is why the nominating committee, when we get together, we elect, the members elect who is on the nominating committee, and then I sit with the nominating committee, and I say, we are questioning God as to who is on the elders' board. Not who is an elder, there are many, but who is on the board this time around. And first we pray, and second we listen very carefully, because the wisdom of the elders means that there will be policy change that really does affect the congregation. So we want the wisest person there, the wisest people there. That is the job of the nominating committee. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, elders who do their work well should be respected and paid well, especially those who work hard at both preaching and teaching. Elders get paid. Currently, I am the only elder that gets paid. But I should be paid well. You ever felt really awkward on stage? I have. I should be paid well. There are some churches where the elders, that job is so big that there are elders that leave their career and they enter into their career of being an elder and they are paid. That is usually a large church. And we call them certain things. Like for instance, associate pastor, worship pastor, youth pastor, elder, deacon, Depending on the size of the church, these people are paid, and they need to be paid well. Oh, it is possible to do it without paying someone. It absolutely is. And it is possible to combine a field if one of your tires go flat. I asked Robin. He said, it's not the best way of doing it. I said, but could it be done? He said, well, it'll hurt the combine. I said, but can it be done? He said, well, it will hurt the crop. It won't look as good. The field will be a mess. I said, but can it be done? Yes, it can be done, but it's not as good as having all the tires on the combine. Yeah, we can do this without paying a pastor, and many churches do. We can do this without paying people in leadership. Many churches do. It's like flattening a tire. Because I need to eat, and my family needs to eat, 
And it is in the scriptures. Those who preach and teach need to be paid. By the way, the question I have before God right now is, are we getting to the place shortly where we need to hire? I would invite you to pray that with me. And when you get your answer, it affects your actions, doesn't it? Those who preach and teach the Bible and those who direct the affairs of the church, they deserve their pay. Hebrews 13, verses 1 to 7. Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. And then in Titus 2, verse 15, you must teach these things. That's for me. You must teach these things and encourage the believers to do them. You have the authority to correct them when necessary. So don't let anyone disregard what you say. What if a person from the church in authority comes to you and corrects you? Are you correctable? I was sitting in my office at a different church, and I was complaining about someone. I, I literally don't remember what it was. I really don't. But I was complaining about something. It bothered me. I didn't like it. And I was complaining. And the lead pastor came up and sat in my office and he listened to me. And he listened to me until I was satisfied. He understood how wronged I was. And he looked at me and his face was loving. I promise it was. He looked at me and he said, how do you think I should react to someone gossiping about someone and complaining? I sort of saw that conversation going a little different than that. I did. I expected that lead pastor to stand up and go correct the wrong. But instead, he looked at me and lovingly corrected me, and he said, no. And I had an option. How would I respond? How would you respond if someone looked at you and said, no? Over these past several years, we have had people look at us and say, no. We have seen a problem emerge. We don't like it when people tell us no. And sometimes the words that come out of our mouth start fires. And those of us in authority need to be ever so careful. And those of us not in authority, perhaps, as you stay and as you listen and as you watch, birthed inside of you will be a desire to love others enough that you will care and that you will guide and that perhaps you might look at them and say, no. Most of the time, you get to say yes. But some of the time, we say no. And we have the authority to do it. That's what defines the church. There's a fight inside of myself every time I go to Costco. Every single time. You know why? They ask to see the receipt for my belongings. And I don't like it. I bought them. Those are mine. I'll give you the cart back. Every time. Every time. Sometimes I don't go to Costco. Because I don't want to show them my receipt. I'm not stealing anything. It's mine. I bought them. question is, do they have the authority to ask as I am on their property with their cart? 
Do they have the authority to ask? And do I have the authority to leave that place in a way that might make them ask the question, who was that guy? There was something different about him. There was something special about him. Or do I have the authority to make sure that they take a picture of me and put it up in the staff room and say, be careful of this guy. He's a handful. Who is an elder? An elder is a person who worships first and foremost. An elder has an administrative role, and it's a big one. And the elder is someone who is uplifting. An elder is someone who points you at Christ. An elder is someone who has the authority to tell you no and will stand before God and be asked, what have you done with the gifts I've given you? It's what an elder is. It's not all an elder is. There's more. There's a whole supernatural part. This is the part that some of you will be excited about and some of you will be very nervous about. I invite you to come back and to hear more about what an elder is. In the meantime, I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and we're going to worship God together. And then I'll come back to the front and close the service. My phone rang on Friday. It was a number I didn't recognize. I answered the phone. Uh, it was a voice I hadn't heard in a lot of years. A guy named Rob Coop. Some people have their, their name is both their names. Ron Baker, Rob Coop. It's Rob Coop. Rob Coop drives truck. He lives in Rostron. Rob Coop is a giant of influence in my life. I don't think he will ever understand how big. When I was in grade seven and I entered youth group, he let me be what I have to imagine was a real handful. See, my, my dad was lead pastor, so I could do what I want. Dwayne just shook his head. <laughs> Dwayne's in on it. Oh, he was gracious to me. Ooh, he let me say some stuff. Yeah, he did. He let me flex. He let me be arrogant. He loved me. He used to invite me into uh, leadership things. And I would do stuff like, I'd run the overhead projector. That is the epitome of authority, by the way. The overhead projector. Thanks for fixing our uh, digital overhead projector. We appreciate that. Man, you do it right. You got to put it on there backwards and upside down so that people see that you did something and then all the attention goes on you. I did it, I promise, every time. He would invite me to pray and then he would give me insight into what was going on in his world and he would ask me to pray for it. I always told him, yeah, I'll pray for it. And sometimes I did. As time went on, he began to give me little bits of authority and he began to look at me and say, I trust you. And he began to call me on my mouth and saying, I think God's in control. And he just guided me into a place of humility, an area that I still struggle with, don't you? When I heard his voice, whew, it sounded a lot like the Holy Spirit to me. He asked me to go look at a car for him in Flaxcomb. He could have asked me to go to the moon. I'd have tried to do it. He loved me. He guided me. And I am here today because he was an elder. And because he let me a lot of stuff. And at the end, he said, Jesus only, Jesus ever, Jesus all, and all we see. Savior, Sanctifier, Healer, Glorious Lord, and Coming King. 
he just kept pointing me at Jesus. And then he said to me, do you know you're not your dad? Do you know what your dad is called to and what your dad is equipped to do and your dad is gifted to do is not you? You have your own calling. You have your own ordination. He said that long before I understood what it meant. So you can understand that when he calls me, apologetically to ask if I'll go look at a car, it was a holy conversation. He was and is an elder, and I love him for it. And there was a day when I said, I need to do what he does, what he does. I need to worship God. And then one day I found myself on a stage talking about him. What does God have in store for you? Will you love someone? Will you love someone enough to point them at Jesus? Book of Romans, chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 13. I'm going to read this over you. I'm going to pray this over you. I invite you to receive it as a gift. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, there's giftings in this church. It is undeniable as we have music on this stage, as we have people who do the things that you have gifted them to do well. All of us have mouths. All of us have fires that we have started with our mouths. Some of us start fires enough that we think that's just the way it is. You say, no, there's more. Lord, I pray for the leadership of this church currently and those who are yet to come. Make us wise. Give us a situation where we are growing so quickly that we need to appoint deacons, admin people. We need to grab hold of them and say, help. And for those who are preaching and teaching, Cheryl Glass, currently in a room right over here on Fridays and Tuesdays the youth group their whole crew the Awana crew women's ministry worship ministry let us teach well for those who are sitting here who have heard your voice calling and have not yet moved, oh, make them restless until they move. Give us great peace when we are living within your calling and give us tremendous turmoil when we are outside of it. And let us see this gift in front of us, Lord God. I want to thank you for this church. It is the best church. Thank you, God. In your name I pray. Amen. Next week there's more. Come back. The food is good, I promise. <laughs>